If I said to you right now, what is the most underappreciated Zelda game, what would you say? No, really, what would you say? Because just between you and me, there have been quite a lot of Zelda games. Like, Jesus Christ, oh my god, that's a lot. There have been 19 main release Zelda games, but if we want to get technical, including all the spin-offs like Hyrule Warriors or the CDI Beauties, and also including the re-released versions of games, there have been a total of 47 Legend of Zelda interactive entertainment experiences. Now, which of these would you say is the most underrated? Yes, you could be that one tool who goes, uh, the complexity of the Game & Watch Legend of Zelda set has never quite been reached again by Nintendo in terms of the code gameplay does shut up! No one cares, no one asks, shut up! To me, when someone asks for the underappreciated title of a series, I think the answer usually gravitates towards an entry that isn't obscure or rare. To me, something that is underappreciated or underlooked is something that was quite big once upon a time, but as the years have passed, it sits on the shelf collecting dust. Okay, I don't know why I'm pulling at your willies and teasing. You've seen the title of the video. The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess is the most underrated Zelda game, and here's why. <laughs> Oh, by the way, like, massive spoilers, so basically, just go play the game. But anyways, two Zelda videos in a row, let's go! I don't even know where to start, to be honest. I just love this game so, 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 so much. Why is Twilight Princess underrated? Well, in a series like The Legend of Zelda, where every game is getting a 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, it can be a little hard after a while for the individual parts to stick out. I mean, let's look at the core 3D Zelda adventures. Ocarina of Time is still one of the most talked about action adventure games maybe ever. You got everything so right on its first try and basically paved the way for not only Nintendo, but the rest of the video game industry as they ventured onwards into 3D. Majora's Mask, whilst always suffering a little bit from younger brother syndrome, was quickly noted by everyone as being a super unique and twisted approach on the so far child-friendly franchise. It's not that they suddenly started putting scary things in your face or braiding your eyes with jump scares, but IG Aonuma took the time to carve out a world with realistic reactions to the horror and grief of impending doom. Wind Waker has had this completely bizarre turnaround where it was just absolutely hated by everyone it released due to its juxtaposing art style compared to what was popular at the time. But now, everyone looks back at Wind Waker super fondly, appreciating it for its gorgeous and bold aesthetic, its wholesome and cute direction, and its attempt at the first truly massive open world Zelda. Skyward Sword split many people. In general, it felt like the division was mostly found between the critics and the fans, with the former praising the game and the latter despising it. Like Wind Waker though, its band of supporters has come to fruition years after the game's release. People love the orchestrated music, the gorgeous French water painting inspired art direction, the brilliant creativity in the world design, and the man who awakened their sexuality, Girahim. I mean, come on, his tongue is so long. Urgh. And of course, we have arguably the next Ocarina of Time, Breath of the Wild. I already made a whole last video on it, but basically it took open world games and made them really, really, really a lot better than they were, and now everyone talks about it. Everyone talks about all these games, a lot. Except Twilight Princess always seems to be left out of the discussion. Now, why is that? In a Game Informer interview, Shigeru Miyamoto says with every single Zelda game, they tried to reinvent the wheel. Yes, that's right, I did research for this video. God, I hope you're happy. And again, you can kind of see that with each game. First 3D action adventure, deep and believable world and characters, first go with an open world-like adventure, one-to-one -one motion controls, and the reinvention of the modern open world. When looking at Twilight Princess, there doesn't seem to be quite anywhere near as much surface innovation. What do I mean by surface innovation? Well, well, from a first glance, Twilight Princess looks to be another run-of-the-mill copy of the previous games. The innovations and step forwards are in all the less obvious bits. The story, the controls, the music, the world, the humor. In fact, since there is no big innovation to this game except for Link turns into a dog, a lot of people see it as kind of unremarkable. In fact, a lot of people still claim Twilight Princess is a remake of Ocarina of Time, which I just, <laughs> that might be the single most stupidest thing you guys have ever said. Come on guys, I'm the stupid one. You can't go around saying stupid shit like that. that that's my job. So too long, don't read. Twilight Princess isn't very talked about much anymore. But here's why it should be. Because spoilers for the rest of the video, guys, the game is really, really cool quite good. This is easily my favorite filled world of any Zelda game. Again, a claim I barely hear anyone ever mention. While Link has gone on countless many classic adventures and endeavors at this point, the world itself hasn't always been the magnum opus main focus. Ocarina of Time is very bright, happy, and cheerful, feeling very much like something you'd see in a Disney movie. Wind Waker is very much the same, albeit with more style. It's very bright, filled with bubbly characters, and gorgeously cute moments. But if I'm gonna be honest, a lot of the worlds of these two games feel quite hollow. Well, there are definitely hubs of people and things to do, 
there is a lot of empty room where it's just... Are we there yet? No, we have another four hours of sailing to go! Majora's Mask improved on this tenfold. While it feels less real in the sense that Termina may be some dreamlike paradox state Link stumbles into, the characters and the scenarios we find ourselves experiencing are so detailed and respondent to the way people in real life would react, it can't not leave a stronger impression. Now, Twilight Princess goes even a step further than Majora's Mask. Right from the get-go, it sets up a world that feels more grounded and lived in. One of Twilight Princess's biggest criticisms is its slow start. And yes, it does take you a good two hours to get to the first dungeon, but it's all for an important reason. Padding. No, 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 it's set up. You spend ages as Link in Aldon Village just being a normal person. You herd goats, talk to locals, help out your neighbors and friends, hang out with the younger kids, flirt with your childhood crush, and more. Giving time for the player to explore Link's ordinary farmer life achieves a couple of things. Firstly, it gives us small roots for which to spur and grow from. Later on in the game, you're gonna be doing a bunch of fucking cool shit. So it's really nice to look back to a simpler time when you stared up at the sky and wished to leave your small village. Secondly, it sets up one of the game's biggest strengths its motivation. In quite a small amount of time, Twilight Princess gets you to care about thy neighbor, whether it's the kids who look up to you, the pregnant wife, or the village mayor. When the village is attacked and the kids are stolen, you have just spent two hours getting to know these guys, and so of course you want to help them. Twilight Princess spends a lot of time establishing and delving into the characters of this world, more than any other Zelda game. In my opinion, this may be the biggest reason that Twilight Princess stands above the rest. While there are prominent and not so prominent figures that have guided the story in previous Zeldas, they usually vary one note without much depth or colour. Zelda's good, Ganon's bad, Sheik's philosophical, etc, etc. Okay, maybe that is a little unfair. Wind Waker actually did surprisingly well with its characters despite its deceptively cartoonish appearance, giving Ganondorf a real and justified motivation for his actions, giving Tetra this double life as a pirate and a princess, and giving the king a redemption arc with his heroic sacrifice. But when we put that next to Twilight Princess, it's not even a question which one does better service of its characters. Twilight Princess does this really brilliant thing where it makes you actually care about the characters around you at the beginning. You've got these adventurous kids who are so impressed by you and your older brother-like skills. Of important notice is Colin, who feels kind of understated in comparison to the rest of the group. He wants nothing more than to just grow up and be like you. Then, of course, there is Ilya. She exudes that perfect, sweet childhood friend slash borderline crush vibe. Even the villagers of Ordon form a connection. It feels like a very tight-knit community in a way I don't think was felt in previous Zelda games. You help each other out in neighborly ways, have chats, and do your day jobs. In the short time before the game really kicks off, you get to care about the people of this village. So when, uh-oh, happens, it kicks off your drive and motivation. Thank you! I, I now give a shit about what I'm doing because you took the time to quickly set up a level of care! And that groundedness comes a little back into play again. When the children are kidnapped, the adults in Ordon are freaking out and are upset and are doing everything they can to get them back. I didn't know this until my last playthrough, but if you go back after you've transformed into Link again, you can find Russell all bloodied and bandaged up trying to save the kids. In a Zelda game? Oh my god, Nintendo, stop it! You didn't! And dude, when you find those kids safe and sound it's such a rewarding feeling even if they can't see you and they think they're gonna die and they have to spend time with the weird bomb guy but then look at this remember that column kid he lives up to his dream of becoming strong like link look at this heroic act even though it results in his kidnapping colin attempts to the selfless act of being a hero character development. Twilight Princess is filled to the brim with interesting and memorable characters big and small. You've got Telma, the sweet and sexy owner of a bar in Castletown who also leads a mini Hyrule oh. resistance. You've got Agatha, a girl who is super obsessed with bugs. When you collect them and give them to her, she tells you a weird fact about them. It's honestly kind of creepy. Oh, you've got all the animals? Yes, that's right, you can talk to the animals in this game. My favourite is Telma's cat who always has your back and helps you out heaps. Like, thanks you pompous puss. Oh, and when you're in the dungeons, there's this super bizarre bird thing called Uka? Oh, and how can I not talk about Malo? I mean, what the fuck is this baby? So serious, so blunt, and then out of nowhere becomes this evil capitalistic millionaire. And then we have the... Oh. <laughs> 
it may be weird to fixate on such small characters, but when you have so many minor personalities making such an impact, it helps make the world feel important. It makes you care about the place around you and again gives you motivation for you to save the people in the world. But one thing Twilight Princess does really well is making moments out of its interactions. Take King Bulbin for example. The first time we see this big dude, he is kidnapping the only thing we really care about, our friends, the kids. So when he pops up again and we've powered up a little, we are fueled up with desire for revenge. After the most bombastic field fight the series has ever had, you have a showdown with him on the bridge. The music in this bit is just brilliant and does nothing but help emphasize how intense this duel is. <laughs> After a nail-biting fight, you finally beat him, and when Link does this awesome pose, it feels earned. If it was any other Zelda game, that would be the last we see of King Boblin. But no, we get another bridge rematch, and then we are surprised by him in Arbiter's Grounds for some hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, sword to massive fucking axe, dude, fuck! And when you defeat him, what does he do? Burns the place down, the nerve of this guy, dude, come on! Then, right at the end of the game, in the stormy atmosphere of Hyrule Castle, you find him for one last fight. Not gonna lie, it's kind of intense. The few interactions you've had with him have been so memorable and this feels like the final showdown between the both of you. When you finally defeat him, instead of burning you or sabotaging you, he concedes and speaks. A monster in a Zelda game speaks to you. Even Midden weighs in on how serious that is. It's moments like this that just make me love Twilight Princess. Instead of getting mostly 2D flat archetypes of characters, so much thought and creativity went into making the people of Hyrule pop off the screen just that little bit more. Okay, but of course, I have to mention the one character who quite literally may be the single reason for this game's success. The best companion we've ever had, Midna. First of all, what has been the purpose of a companion so far in Zelda? A literal navigation aid with Navi? An annoying sassy remix of said navigation with Tattle? Someone to occasionally interrupt you for no reason with the king of red lines? A fucking annoying piece of shit fight! Basically, at the end of the day, they are there to help guide the player when lost. While they experimented a little with characterization of the companion with Tattle, by the time they got to Twilight Princess, they were dying to do something new. Midna is easily the best companion character of the whole series. Maybe even the best written character of the whole damn series. Unlike previous companions, Midna isn't just an unwilling servant to the demands of Link. If anything, it's the other way around. She has her own agenda and her own goals and Link is just a tool for her to use to get it done. She is very sassy, very condescending and teases Link at every shortcoming. When you first meet her, she mocks Link with the faces of his kidnapped friends. Yikes! At the start of the game, she's very selfish. She forces you to get her a sword and shield. She ditches you when you're both trapped in a burning building. She really has you by the ropes for the first leg of the journey. But as you continue through this adventure and circumstances change, you really feel like your relationship with her grows as she learns to change and adapt. The more you travel together, the more she opens up. It's not until the third dungeon in which she actually tells you why she's been making you run around to do what you've been doing, and the reason is really compelling. Then right after that, you run into the big bad villain, Zand, who, after a quick tease at some lore, defeats Midna and Link in one easy swoop. Suddenly, Midna is on death row and you have to save her. This beautiful piano track plays as you literally run across all of Hyrule as a wolf, desperately trying to make it through the rain and past the enemies, trying to get her to Zelda before she dies. And why are you doing this? Not because the game is telling you to, but because you actually care. The game has planted all the seeds and has earned this serious moment with you. When you do get her to Zelda, her dying wish is to stop the evil of the world. In a twist and turn of events, Zelda sacrifices herself for Midna, and you can see the panic in her eyes. Suddenly, everything changes, and Midna now becomes super pragmatic and sympathetic about Hyrule, and wants nothing more than to take down Zant. It's just moments like these that really make Twilight Princess shine. If Midna wasn't in the game, there is no way anything would be as good. If it's not for her sarcastic and sassy comments, it's her oddly relaxing spliced up voice. This cute man for the Dewey Man. For real, you think it would sound like something out of Bando Gazooie, but it sounds really good. Fun fact, her voice clips are actually scrambled English sentences. Which one will it be? Have you made up your mind? I'll take you there with my power. What do you think happened to those who try to rule with sacred magic? I have a request. Would you find a mirror? Don't go running off. I'll be watching. I guess you aren't stupid. Midna is literally the glue that holds Twilight Princess together. Well, actually, I guess that would be a pona. <laughs> Horse jokes, funny glue! She really is what ties the world together and makes it so engaging and fun. There are like a million moments I love with her. I love before the Arbiter's Ground how she shyly opens up to Link about the history of her tribe. I love her bit of dialogue after Argorok is killed. And I love her despair-filled realization of her power when she kills Zant. Oh, okay, bro, now we gotta talk about Zant. Zant may be one of the most interesting villains to date. The first time we hear of him is in this boss-ass cutscene. His shadow beasts just run in and storm the castle, 
killing everyone and what does Zant do? Just walks in so coolly. The next time you see him is terrifying. You just turn around and there he is, BAM! With no resistance at all, he just wrecks you and Midna. The next time you see him after that, actually this one's kind of lame and no one talks about it, so um, yeah, they should have kept that out. No, but for real, the best part about Zant is how they set up this super composed diabolical villain for the entire game and then just chuck it out the window. At the end of the game, when you approach Zant, you're expecting the calm and collected badass, but he just snaps. Suddenly he becomes this homicidal maniac who is screaming and jumping all over the place and dude, it's so good. His boss fight is so memorable because it's this wacky turned upside down boss rush of everything we've seen before, but hosted by this Jar Jar Binks Homer Simpson hybrid. And after you defeat him, he paves way for the real villain of the game. Okay, I know a lot of people really don't like Ganondorf in this game, feeling he takes the limelight away from Xan. I honestly like it. He's teased in a cutscene in the middle of a game and then comes back right at the end with the reveal that he was the one pulling all the strings behind the scenes. And his design in this game just looks so cool. He is so big and bulky and has such a demeaning look about him. Hold up really quick. He looks great here, but then here? Oh, bro, yuck! Why, what the, why, what did they do to him? And same with Link. Look on a mask with my boy. Link is another big character I want to talk about. Oh my god, I need to get this off my chest. On the promotional line, in pictures, in Smash, in everything, where they show Twilight Princess Link, he looks like this. Ho, 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 ho. They show this super tough and edgy guy, but that's not Link from Twilight Princess. This is super soft, peaceful, happy, caring. Of course, there are moments where he's all yeah! But the majority of the time in this game, Link has a very soft look to him. It frustrates me to no end that people look at him from other mediums and go, yeah, the edgy Link. Like, bro, no, he, he's not edgy. He's not blonde. He's not gruff. He's like a sweet and caring older brother. There are so many moments where you can actually see the emotion in his eyes as he looks down at the kids he saved or wakes up from the slow possession of dark power or panic when Minna is hurt. He may be as silent as ever, but he feels a little more realized. Look, okay, I know I've talked about this point for a hot minute and a half now, but I think it's what Twilight Princess does so well that the other games don't quite reach. Wind Waker kind of set the seeds for this with having your sister be kidnapped, but then the island just kind of chills out for the entire game. Really, the whole world chills out. They don't really care about anything that's happening. Actually, do they even know what's happening? <laughs> do they? But in Twilight Princess, everything is in danger of being drowned in Twilight or being shafted by Big Bad Ganon. So how do they make you care about that? Well, they make Link this average ordinary farmhand and make you form a connection with the people which then gives you a reason to care and go through on your journey. A journey which is then propelled by the mystery and intrigue of your sassy companion Minna, piloted forward even further by the insanity of the Big Bad villain Zant, which is then stripped away at the last second for a classic battle between good and evil. It's as simple as that. Okay, seriously, thank you for making it through this section that no one cares about except for me. Now what you really came for. It may be clear after the last video and this last entire section, gameplay isn't my favorite thing about Zelda. But don't get me wrong, if a game isn't fun to play, I won't play it. But having a world that's good and interesting goes a long way in keeping me invested. It's lucky for us, Twilight Princess does both really well. This was the fourth 3D Legend of Zelda title. By this point, Nintendo had a very solid grip on their Ocarina of Time formula. You go to a dungeon, get a new item from the mini boss, use it to complete the second half of the dungeon, beat the boss, use that new item to get to the next dungeon, rinse and repeat. Twilight Princess doesn't major improve or shine in a bold direction with the gameplay. Instead, I think where Twilight Princess gets it right is, again, with all the small things it changes. For example, this is the only Zelda game where you can run and swing your sword at the same time. It is insane to me how and why this feels so good to do. It works wonders when running through grass or into a group of enemies. Going back to any other game and then trying to swing is just, bleh, bro, I need this feature back so bad. Do you know how good it feels to just run around and swing your sword? Like, so good! But in general, Link controls really nicely in this game. His roles are a beautiful far cry from the sluggish stop and start of the N64 days, and Link has a great turning circle. Okay, maybe a little too great. Uh, okay, okay, oh, oh, somebody stop him! The big innovative feature this time around is Link's new ability to transform into a wolf. It's definitely interesting, I'll say that. I can easily understand why people wouldn't like this. There are three major sections at the start of the game where you're forced to be Wolf Link for a long period of time. I don't mind these, especially in the HD version which shortened them from their monotonous lengths of the original. But Wolf Link can be really interesting. It makes you reevaluate the world and surroundings you find yourself in, and forces you to figure out how to maneuver in a non-traditional way. With Midna, you can even jump super long distances and traverse in a super unique fashion. And again, a lot of the charm that comes along with Wolf Link is just getting an interaction time with Midna. She sits on your back and commands your steed as you run around the world, barking, growling, and howling. Oh, speaking of, gone from the Zelda game for the first time in a 3D title is Link's musical ability. There's no instrument Link plays, no ocarina, no conductor's baton, no fucking bongo drums. 
Instead, Link can grab these reeds of grass and blow on them to call my ass. Oh yeah, by the way, you can name the horse in this game and I just think that's very funny. <laughs> The only other musical-like thing is through Wolf Link who can howl to its tune. Goodbye old system and me picking the notes I play myself. Aww. In summary, I love Wolf Link. It really gives this game a unique voice and charm and ties in thematically with the narrative. And playing as Wolf Link is fun, whether it's exploring or in combat, which is really similar to how Link normally fights, just with a mouthful of razor sharp teeth instead of a cool sword. Oh, speaking of cool swords though, this time around there is a greater focus on combat. While the old technique of just waiting around and slashing your sword or spamming spin attacks does still work, the game gives you a multitude of new options for fighting with. You get the ending blow, which lets you kill enemies who are incapacitated instead of waiting for them to get back up like the previous games. You've got the shield attack, a nice little push of the shield which can put enemies off balance. The back slice, a move from the Wind Waker which you can pull off at any time now instead of waiting for a parry. The helm splitter, where Link just does a full fucking Spider-Man and does a flip. Don't flip! Yeah! Then there's the mortal draw. Basically, you just walk up to a dude and go, hey, check this out. You're dead. I don't think it's very uh, practical, but it makes me feel like a cool samurai. You've got an upgraded jump attack. I I don't really know if this one's that, that useful though, so um, yeah. Then you have the great spin. When at full health, you can do a super powerful spin attack. Yeah, whoa, cool. I love the idea of giving us more and more moves to take to the dance floor of combat. It really mixes things up if you're sick of the stagnant and simplistic combat of the previous games. The problem with the new moves though, apart from like the first two, is that they're not really necessary. You don't need to use any of these moves. You can just spin attack everything over and over again and you'll win. In fact, I have never gotten the last three hidden moves until this recent playthrough and it felt like I had to really go out of my way to find them. But getting them is actually a super fun endeavor. You go to these stones and howl at them and get this cute little wolf howling cutscene with a rather gorgeous scenic backdrop. Then you have to find a ghostly wolf who transforms into a big stealth foe, which actually may or may not be the old Link from Ocarina of Time. Dude, what Zero Pussy does to a guy. Another big change coming off the last couple of games is the removal of the magic meter. Dude, that's pretty huge. It must have been a late change because on the box art for the Wii, you can see an in-game screenshot and... Oops. So if Link can't use magic to aid him this time around, how does he do any of the cool stuff we've come to expect? Well, Link is really buff. I mean, really buff. He's throwing sheep, throwing gorons, throwing this big fucking metal ball around. Dude, literally, how does that work? He looks like he's breaking his back just holding it. What? Oh, my back! Oh, speaking of, the items are quite interesting in this game. You've got the usuals, of course, like the bow and arrow, the slingshot, bombs, iron boots, etc. But this time around, there are a few unique new additions. We've got the aforementioned ball and chain, which is as simple as the name implies. We've got the spinner, which again is kind of as simple as the name implies. You can go into certain cracks on the wall and sometimes teabag holes in the ground, so th that's cool. You've got the double claw shot, which is a super cool upgrade to the normal hook shot by giving you another one. Now you can claw around like Spider-Man. The bombs are really cool in this game because you've got normal bombs, but then you've also got underwater bombs. Okay, that's not that cool, but what is cool is bomb arrows. You can put them on the tip of your arrow and then shoot them and ah, oh, dude, it's so cool. One of the worst items though is the Dominion Rod. It lets you control statues. Uh, okay. <laughs> you only end up using it for like one dungeon, so I don't know. But I guess speaking of, that's a nice transition to... This may be Twilight Princess's greatest strength, which I've said about like five different things now. While the moment to moment gameplay and formula hasn't been shaken up too much, the team really went to work at reinforcing and building upon the structure of the dungeons in this game. They're all really good, except for like one, which is the water one, but that's kind of a given. And actually to be fair, it is still pretty good. Why are they so good, you may ask? Well, firstly, they're actually pretty difficult. I mean, like any other Zelda, once you've played it once, it becomes a little easier to breathe through on replays. But on my first playthrough, I got very stumped a lot of times, only in very rare instances do these stumps feel cheap. Most of the time, they're well earned in the way they make you reevaluate your situation. The times they feel cheap though do kind of burn. In Snowpeak's Ruin, there is this one block puzzle that took me maybe 30 minutes on my second playthrough. I swear to God, I tried every single combination. Oh, that wasn't actually that bad. Oh, that's right, I forgot, I'm stupid. But come on guys, this is Snug Boy. You know it's not the gameplay of a video game that makes me care. <laughs> Are you stupid, man? Come on. The best thing about these dungeons is how brilliantly they are themed. From the music to the design to the concepts, it's all just so much more special in Twilight Princess. In a callback to Ocarina of Time, our first three dungeons are forest, fire, and then water themed. But even in this nostalgic return to coal, the team tries some new and interesting ideas. The forest temple is a giant treehouse powered entirely by wind power. There are also like a million acrobatic monkeys for you to swing on. And for a first dungeon, it feels especially rank and dark and dirty and kind of spooky. For 
a beginner temple, I think it leaves a great impression and raises the bar for the rest of the game. The Goron Mines is again another cool twist on a classic. It's set in Death Mountain, of course, but it's infused with this industrialized mine setting. And I love how you have to find the key piece by piece by talking to all these old Goron dudes who are literally just vibing. You also get this super cool gravity altering concept that has you flinging about onto giant magnetic lifts. But when you have to walk on the walls, dude, it's so slow, hurry up. But the gravity stuff has you solving puzzles in some super unique ways. Oh, but the best part is how dramatic Link is when he drowns in lava. Dude, damn, the Oscars are canceled this year. Put that away. Next is Lake Bed Temple. Moving on. Arbiter's Ground is, uh, okay, okay, fine. We'll talk about Lake Bed Temple. I just think it's way too confusing. It's not bad, but I am really stupid and I just can't do it without a guide. You've got to control the water flow with this stupid rotating staircase thingy that can just fuck right off. I can barely do the water temple, man. This just feels like the worst. But, 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 once you beat this dungeon, the game really changes and puts itself into second gear. Next is the Arbiter's Grounds, which is genuinely one of the coolest in the whole series. It's this Indiana Jones-like desert temple with skeletons and ghosts and ghost rides and you get to ride around on this giant Beyblade, so I mean, what's not to love? The next is the fan favorite, Snow Peak Ruins. Well, I mean, you know the dungeon is gonna be fun when the way to get there is by snowboarding down a mountain. <laughs> Snow Peak Ruins is actually very different from your typical dungeon, because it isn't really one. You're in the house of these two yetis, one of whom is sick. You're looking for a shard of the Twilight Mirror and she keeps telling you where the key for it is. But every time you go to where she says it is, it ends up being a piece of food. But you get to use this piece of food for a yum soup, so that's great. Next is the Temple of Time, and honestly, kind of my least favorite thematically. While it's got a very solid concept, it does just feel like you're running all the way up and down a marble hallway. Then finally, we have the City in the Sky. Dude, I love the city in the sky. You finally made it to the home of Uka and they try speaking to you in this weird font like, um, I don't speak dumbass, sorry. But genuinely, this dungeon is super unique and feels very weird and almost like something out of a MC Escher painting. And they really put your brain to use with the way you have to use the double claw shots. And after that, there are technically two more dungeons if you count the Palace of Twilight and Hyrule Castle, which for some reason in my brain, I always think of as two different things. But if you aren't stupid like me and count it that way, there are nine dungeons in this game. Eight being really good and one being being, eh, it's all right. But the best part about the dungeons that makes them so good is the bosses. These have to be, hands down, the best bosses in the whole series. Like, damn. While the first one does kind of leave you wanting more, the second one, Firest, just gets you so excited for what's to come. I think what I love the most about them is that they feel really epic. Uh, yes, I know that word is oversaturated, but it's really hard to describe it in any other way. In a lot of them, you feel like David and Goliath, as Link has to take on this massive beast of an enemy that dwarfs him in size. And what's great is that you have to use the the item you found to defeat them in a way that feels a bit more clever than usual. For example, with Phyrus, you have to pull at his chains with the iron boots so he falls over. Or in Morpheal, oh, oh wait, I forgot to say, remember how I said the Lake Bed Temple sucks? Bro, that doesn't count anymore because Morpheal is one of the best bosses. A water dungeon boss is one of the best. There, I said it. I'm not afraid to say what's controversial. One second it sucks ass as you just sit there waiting for the eye to go through the tentacle. Then all of a sudden he's swimming around and knocking pillars over and you're desperately swimming around this guy trying not to get hurt and then you get claw shot into his eye and just stab him and ah! Then back to Indiana Jones. We get on our Beyblade and have to fight this giant floating skull and it is so adrenaline filled and brilliant. Another banger. Then guess what? Remember that sweet Yeti? Well, surprise, surprise, we have to fight her. You've got to look at the floor of the new PS5 ray tracing reflections and avoid her shards of ice. And when we beat her, <gasps> oh my God, that is so sweet. I. I... Romance is alive and well. But not for me! Anyway, here's the worst boss in the game. It's just a giant spider. But okay, to be fair, you do get this pretty funny gag where you think it's dead, but nope. And then to top it all off, you have Argarok. It's a dragon. Come on. Dragons are cool. Now, a big reason why these boss fights are so brilliant and why they stump bosses from all the other games is for one element unique to Twilight Princess, dynamic and adaptive music. Uh, what's that? Well, when you fight a boss in Majora's Mask, let's say, the game starts playing the boss music and that's it. That's all you're gonna hear. While in Twilight Princess, when you start fighting a boss, you'll hear its theme, but when you get into a moment of uphand victory, the music changes to the triumphant and epic main motif of the game. I mean, let's go. It really is just that little sprinkle on top of the cake that makes the fight more intense, more adrenaline, field and more fun. And I mean, now it's time to talk about my favorite thing about this game, and that's the music. 
I know all music and art is subjective, but Twilight Princess has the best music in the entire franchise and it's not even a competition. While every Zelda game has really good music, again, Twilight Princess just feels like they took that one step up compared to the rest. The score to this game feels like a true connected symphony, as opposed to various chopped and spliced individual themes. What do I mean? Well, in Twilight Princess, we get a lot of running themes and light motifs. For example, here is Minda's theme. Instead of playing only when Minda is on screen like they would in previous Zeldas, the melody is woven into a million different places depending on what is happening. For example, when we first see her, we hear it in the background. We hear it recontextualized to a happier note with the boss battle defeated music. And we hear it on the very triumphant title screen, which ends on what? Minda's theme. Dude, is this game about Minda? Oh my god, what? Another big one is Link's heroic theme, unique to this game. Of course, it plays during Hyrule Field, which by the way, this may be the best Hyrule Field theme to date. Halfway through, we hear this motif. Now, whenever Link does anything cool, we hear that again. One of the coolest uses of this idea of themes is during the boss battles, which I already mentioned, but I cannot explain further how amazing it feels to be sweating away at a boss to already amazing music, and then when you get that chance to hit it, you guys get that epic theme, boys, let's go! It might sound small, but having these themes and motifs weave in and out of the story makes the game feel more connected and powerful. By having an interconnected score with themes lending a powerful hand to different moments, it not only helps tie the world and narrative together, but it just sounds great. But aside from that, when we're talking about all the individual themes, I mean, Twilight Princess just has the best music. I mean, Hyrule Field, come on. Lake Hylia, come on. Ganon, oh, come on. The house theme, bro, they added an extra part to the house theme, let's go. But there are so many other tracks which no one gives attention to. Sans boss fight is literally the coolest thing ever. Just like him, it's a deranged and degrading remix of all the previous boss fights. Speaking of the boss fights, maybe some of the best boss music ever. But after you beat a boss and the fight is all over and done, you are serenaded with this beautifully relaxing mystical tune. Okay, remember King Bulban? There is no way I would remember this moment with such delight if it wasn't for this amazing score. You get this triumphant array of horns and drums and choir as you chase him down. Then when you get to the bridge, what do you get? This Wild West one-on-one -on -one whistle. And of course, I can't not mention The Hidden Village, which is just this beautiful homage to the Wild Wild West days of old. The music of this game is a two-sided coin. On one side, it is very bombastic and triumphant and adventurous. The other side is very subdued, quiet and beautifully relaxing. I mean, here's Hyrule Field during the day. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Then here's Hyrule Field at night. That's nice. One of my favorites is Farron Woods. If it was any other Zelda game, it would probably have a big bright score that is very jumpy and quirky. But here we get this very beautiful but ominous tune. A lot of the music is so relaxing, it is usually my go-to when writing or needs something easy to listen to in the background. I cannot tell you how many times I listened to this video during studying in high school. Look, basically what I'm trying to say is the music of Twilight Princess is super important to this game. Not just because Zelda has a reputation for good music, but because this time they really tried to go above and beyond with integrating it into the story and narrative and creating a richer world. And they succeeded. The music is such a brilliant narrative and world building tool and it all comes together perfectly for the final climax. <laughs> Nothing makes me love this game any more than its conclusion. Because it's over. <laughs> Okay. It's like the stars of the narrative align and everything that has been set up thematically comes to fruition. First, you make it to the absolutely gorgeously atmospheric Hyrule Castle. <laughs> I thought I wouldn't be able to say that. Then it all comes to heat when you storm up those stairs. Lightning flashing, wind hurling, it's just so intense. Then you see him, Ganondorf. Daddy. Just the pure personification of evil. There are a couple different fights we have to do with Ganondorf. Between each fight, however, are nice bits of character interaction and story beats. Like Midna trying to protect Zelda, Zelda and Link calling to the spirits, and also before all of that, Midna turning into a fucking beast, and then Link holding her like a little baby. Aww. Also, this finale just has some of the coolest shots. I mean, look at this. And I'll always love how time slows down as Zelda teleports the pair away at the last second. But nothing beats Ganondorf's brutal death. And how, as he stands, barely able to walk, Zank comes in and... <laughs> Then, maybe my favorite part of the whole game, Midna's reappearance. The music swells and swells as Link runs to see her again. And then we get this. Won't have to have me there. Beautiful girl, we built space. 
it's the perfect thing for her to say. Then roll credits, blah, 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 blah. Boom, this is a Marvel movie now. There's a post credit scene, but this scene is what always makes me so sad. Even though the world is saved, even though Midna has come to care about the light, even though we've just shared this massive adventure together, she decides last second to trap herself into the Twilight Realm for the rest of time. The worst part is what she says to Link. Oh, I just can't, dude. I always get so emotional. I, this ending just hits different. And it's all because of Minda. She is the heart and the soul and the lemon and the line of this game. Everything she does and is a part of makes you care about this world and your objective and what you are doing. I really love this game. Every time I finish it, I just get so overwhelmed by emotions, I just can't. This is, for now anyways, my favorite Zelda game of all time. Okay, but sometimes the game is really fucking stupid. <laughs> I know we just sucked the game off for god knows how long, but let's take a step back and be objective. What doesn't the game do right? Well, just for reference, I am playing the HD version. I own the Wii version, but never actually got very far into it. I mean, I was a bit younger, but that didn't stop me from completing the other Zelda games. I think Twilight Princess has a weird progressive difficulty spike. What I mean by that is, you know when you're lost in a game and you have that feeling of, where do I go? Well, that comes up heaps in Twilight Princess. On the original GameCube and Wii version, for instance, in Auden Village, you have to get the fishing rod and then catch a fish twice? for some reason? Why would anyone do something, have it not work, and then do it again? Thankfully, they changed this for the HD version, but there are still some weird instances of things like this. When you need to get the reek fish sent for Snow Peak Ruins, you need to go to Kakariko and talk to the Zora Prince. Maybe I've just done it wrong on all my playthroughs, but I swear you talk to him once, he says nothing, and then you have to enter into conversation with him again for him to actually give you the fancy fish hook. Dude, what the fuck? In general, progression between dungeons can be less than optimal. Sometimes they require you to grab really specific items which can only be obtained in super linear ways. Sometimes the time between dungeons is super short, but sometimes you've got to do like a million fucking stupid things to get to it. The journey between the Temple of Time and City in the Sky just feels like the bullet to the ankle at the end of a 25k marathon. You have to go to Talma, then go to Kakariko, then go to the Hidden Village, do the sick ass Wild West Hidden Village bit, then go back to Kakariko, restore Ilya's memory, then go back to Hidden Village, show Impaz your dodo dominion rod, then go back to Kakariko, talk to the nerd in the basement, he restores the Rod, then you've got to find the 12 statues or whatever, then you go back again to Kakariko to get the cannon or whatever, then you go to Lake Hylia, then you get it fixed, and then, and only then can you enter the city in the sky, dude, oh, what the fuck? Especially at the end of the journey, it can just be so exhausting. And speaking of Ilya's memory, I've said about a million times in this video now, I love how we have motivation to do the journey because we care about the characters or whatever, but the whole Ilya memory thing is just chucked out the window. We finally find her again, but she has amnesia, then we kind of just forget about her until right at the end we're told we can restore her memory? So we do, and then there's this nice cutscene between the two, and then she just kind of stands in a room for the rest of time. Like, okay, happy for you, B. Also, if we're on the topic of little story quirks, I love Ganondorf, but why doesn't he do anything until we show up? I mean, he locks Hyrule Castle behind this big F off pyramid, but then just sits there until we rock up? Like, dude, I've got four dungeons to go, just kill the world already. Also, at the start of the game, people being drowned in Twilight seems like this awful, terrible thing. You talk to people and they're in a constant state of fear and horror, but then when you get to Hyrule Castle, everyone's just living their normal lives? I'm just like, what? Does it even matter then that the Twilight is here? Like, they don't seem to care. This dude seems as happy as ever. I really wish they played into that more, having it be this constant feeling of unease or dread or something, I don't know. I know I just praised the music wholeheartedly like five seconds ago, but who the fuck decided to make the music MIDI? Yes, 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 yes. I, I know the GameCube had a disc the size of a peanut, but the music is just so left behind in its sampled form. It's especially heartbreaking when we've heard the music performed by orchestras in the many concerts since the game's release. Listen to this. And then this. This. That. This. That. It's just a shame. And speaking of music, sometimes the game just reuses themes from the old games with absolutely zero reasoning apart from a quick nostalgia bite, I guess. When you're doing the wolf howling, the song of healing is one of them. Uh, that's cool, I guess. But what does it actually have to do with anything? I know one of you guys in the comments is going, um, actually, the hero's shade is linked from Majora's Mask, so like, I, I don't, get shut up. The version I've been showing and playing is the HD remake of the game on the Wii U. Uh, problem number one, it's stuck on the Wii U. When the Switch came out, I was so optimistic that it would be ported over alongside Wind Waker HD almost straight away. How wrong I was, it's been almost four years. Problem number two, this is the original. Now this is the HD one. 
Oh, wait, actually, sorry. I swapped between the GameCube and Wii. Okay, now this is the HD one. That's it? Yeah, look, they could have pushed it a lot more. I actually think it still looks good. And when you compare the original to the HD, the improvements are actually very nice. You don't realize how pixelated a lot of the textures were until you see them compared. Saying that though, when Wind Waker looked like this, and then Wind Waker HD looked like this, oh my God, holy shit. It's just a little disappointing. We didn't get some nicer looking shadows or whatever. But the funniest part about the HD version is that it was ported over by an Australian company. <laughs> G'day mate, how are you, cover? And the best part is how you have all these Japanese names in the credits and then when it gets to the HD credits you suddenly get the most bogan sounding Australian names. <laughs> but the absolute worst thing about the port is the stamps. Remember the Miiverse? It was Nintendo's weird social media experiment thing. There were actually some kind of funny posts made by stupid kids on there and there was this one guy who used to comment nice water on every game so that was fun. Uh, but one of the cool parts was you could draw things and have stamps. Twilight Princess HD thought it would be a good idea to make you find all these stamps in the game. This is not a good idea. Imagine this. You're spelunking your way through a dungeon and you see a chest up high or in the distance or something. You go out of your way to solve a puzzle or to pass an obstacle and when that magical chest is opened, stamp. And this happens like all the goddamn time. It kind of makes you not want to open the chest. So yikes. Now the last thing I want to complain about is kind of a weird concept. I saw this tweet being like, we're playing old games as a bunch of shit parts, but when you finish it's a 10 out of 10. And I think I get that a tiny bit with Twilight Princess. Gameplay wise, there are a few hiccups here and there. Skyward Sword is infamous for its overabundant handholding and coming out right before that one, you can kind of see them lean into it a bit more and more. There are times when you'll know what to do, but Midna insists you ask her anyways. There's some puzzles which will just show you what to do, even if again, it's quite obvious. Like it's not terrible, but I'm not dumb either, dude. I I can figure it out. And in dungeons, as per tradition, they give us new items to use, which is cool. But a lot of the time they become obsolete very quickly. The slingshot, the fishing rod, the spinner, the ball and chain, the dominions rod, these all feel very forgotten after their one or two seconds in the spotlight. But every now and then, and it's rare, but every now and then we get just a fucking stupid shit part. The block puzzle you have to complete before getting the master sword can just fuck right off. Come on, dude, this sucks. Also, I know I've spent a lot of time saying how I love that I care about saving the world in this game, but when I say world, I mean the people and like the two towns. The actual Hyrule field is a bit empty. Look, I don't super mind because you're just traveling through it half the time and you can stop off to do little things here and there like explore a cave or whatever, but it is a bit barren. But look, overall, even with the slight problems here and there, I really love this game. I love the sound effect when you teleport and how you get turned into black little squares. I love the way the sun shimmers over the horizon. I love how Wolf Link can hold onto things by his two paws. I love the sound effect of the text box. I love that there's a free controlled camera with the right stick. I love Minda's voice. I love when Link opens a door, he has to use two hands to push it up. I love when Wolf Link falls and you hear him howl to his death. I love how peaceful and quiet the game is, especially the opening, which is so soft-spoken and hushed compared to the epic tales that open the other games. I love this weird and creepy cutscene with Link and Ilya. I I love that you can hold cats and dogs. I love how the game is actually funny sometimes. I love the music and the atmosphere and the writing of all the hidden skills, especially that now well-read line, a sword wields no strength unless the hand that holds it has courage. I love the way Link sounds and I love the look of his tunic and I love his smile. Shigeru Miyamoto has gone on record saying it felt like there was something missing from Twilight Princess. This is also the guy who thought Star Fox Zero was a really good idea. I think Twilight Princess excels in what it's trying to do so incredibly well. Through its characters, through its story, through its music, through its solid gameplay, Twilight Princess achieves something special no other Zelda game has been able to reach. It speaks in this super unique voice that I just resonate with a lot. I know this has been a long video, I know you probably don't care about it as much as I do, but it just feels nice to love games. To love something so much you get so excited and passionate and emotional when you play. To write and edit a whole ass video about it. To constantly force your friends to listen to your mirror out of rants about how good it is when they really don't care. Twilight Princess is that for me. And frankly, sometimes it feels like it's just me. Occasionally I hear a bubble or two from someone else who likes it, but right now, people are really overlooking this one. Twilight Princess is a fantastic game, and if you haven't, you really should play it. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I know it was long, I know it was painful, but you guys don't even know. My ass hurts, my voice hurts, my brain hurts. If you play Twilight Princess, let me know what you think in the comments below. I actually really love the discussions we get going and I love the jokes. Tell me if I'm right, tell me if I'm wrong, tell me how I as always exude big virgin energy. And guys, please have a fantastic day. Stay snug. See ya.